At Mount Rainier National Park, climate change is more than just a threat. It's happening already. The park's glaciers are melting faster than ever, washing out roads, bridges, and historic buildings. Scientists fear endangered plants and animals will be lost, and the park changed completely. Floods and avalanches forced the park to shut down for six months in 2006. That led to the permanent closure of the Carbon River Road, keeping visitors away from some of the park's most spectacular areas. Park managers are required to protect the park's resources and still provide for public enjoyment. Faced with that conflict, they are struggling to find a way forward. People have described climate change as a wicked problem. Sometimes I think the solutions are pretty straightforward, but they're very difficult to achieve. You know, there are economic, social, political interests that all have to be factored into an overall approach to how we're going to wrestle with something that is as systemic and as broad and big and scary as climate change. From a public standpoint, I think the real challenge is sustaining infrastructure, notably roads and trails uh, and other facilities that really support you know, the 1.7 million or so people that come here every year. Federal laws, such as the Wilderness Act of 1964, were passed to protect the environment, but they weren't written with climate change in mind. Moving park roads to safer ground would literally take an act of Congress. Currently, we have 97% of the park is designated wilderness. Uh, for the most part, about 200 feet off the roads, the paved roads, and 100 feet off the dirt roads is designated wilderness. So that may require a, a change in the wilderness boundary if we want to try to get to higher ground. But then you have all the other associated impacts, whether it's loss of old growth forest to, to build a road or the removal of that very resource that some of the people are coming to, to visit. So it's, it's a very fine uh, balancing act that we do have, but, but we're very cognizant that if, if we don't provide access that either people won't come or they may not support it, or they may not even understand the value of what the parks are. The most immediate threats are caused by the downhill rush of rock and gravel from the melting glaciers. The park's rivers are filling with sediment, forcing the water to find new routes. Since climate change has started and we've had a recession and a tremendous loss of glacier ice, we've had a big bumping up in the amount of sediments coming into the river. And so these the active part of the river that, where the wetted channel is and where there isn't much vegetation, where the main stem of the river's been living, starts to fill with sediment. But it's still somewhat contained by these large, century-old trees. Uh, but at some point, water has to flow downhill. And in, during a big flood, it'll eventually punch through an area between two trees. Other rivers at Mount Rainier, this is happening, but instead of the whole main stem river, it's really a relatively small flood channel. We call it an avulsion channel that's either being reoccupied or created. But they're very small compared to the main stem. Now they still do a tremendous amount of damage to park roads. Like on the White River and State Route 410, we've had hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage from these channels that when we look at an aerial photograph, we can hardly see. The reason we're studying the Carbon River is we came up here and we noticed that not, not only are we getting these little avulsion channels, we're literally getting the whole main river moving very quickly, catastrophically, in a wholesale way. And literally, this forest that took centuries to create was destroyed in just years. So there's a tremendous lag between the creation of something and the destruction of it, and we're going to be in this intermediate area where we don't get the benefit of a robust forest, where the river is going to be extremely dynamic because it's going to take centuries to get trees back here. Another river, the Nisqually, is so built up by increased sediment that it runs 30 feet above the historic settlement of Longmire. Hundreds of thousands of visitors stop at Longmire each year on their way up the mountain. Park officials built a dike to protect the settlement, but they know it's only a temporary solution. Right now, it's very difficult to get money to do a lot of flood protection work. Um, we can generally get money after something breaks, but you know it's more difficult right now. There's just not a lot of money available to actually do the preventative work in, in ways and in places where you know you're vulnerable. As we continue to um, provide repairs, it, it winds up affecting how I do my studies because there may not be funding for that may affect how we keep our visitor centers open because, again, there may not be adequate funding because you've done road repairs. Um, 
It's, it's a tough balancing act. The plants and animals that live on Mount Rainier are delicately balanced. Even small climate changes will send waves throughout the ecosystem. The park's old growth forests will become more vulnerable to insects and fire, and wetlands will dry up. We're monitoring the cascade frog because we think it'll be a fairly sensitive species um, to climate change. This is more of a permanent pond, but a lot of the other ponds aren't as permanent. And they, they breed in these ponds and then they dry up before the tadpoles get a chance to turn into frogs, which basically means they all die. So the reproductive effort from um, you know, several females in one year is just gone. It's, it's almost like a whole generation of, of frogs is gone. We're trying to get baseline data on this to see how often this happens now, and then we're going to combine this with um, um, predictions of how climate change will affect these ponds, which we think that they'll dry more frequently and sooner. And some of these permanent ponds like this will shift to temporary ponds. And so we want to know how that's going to affect the population of frogs overall. High on the mountain, the park's lush wildflower meadows, the biggest attraction for the nearly two million people who visit the park each year, are in trouble too. According to phenologists, scientists who study plant and animal life cycles, the wildflower and the animals they support could be driven out. So the meadows are in trouble, um, really for kind of a couple of reasons. One is they're getting squeezed out because the trees are marching uphill, but in order for them to maintain the area of land that they occupy, they have to march uphill as well. But it's hard for them to do that because the soil is really undeveloped the higher up on the mountain you go. And the environment, of course, is a lot harsher. So the snow lasts longer, it's colder, it's windier, it's more exposed. So the wildflowers are going to have a hard time establishing in the, in the, in the higher elevations. Doesn't phyllodosy produce a lot of pollen too? Or a lot of protein? It, it's protein rich, yeah. yeah. Wildflowers are really sensitive to the timing of snow melt. And, and they're, as the snow is melting earlier and earlier with climate change, the wildflowers are blooming earlier and earlier. But not all flowers are responding the same way. Some will, will flower even more early than others. And that could be problematic for them th through their interaction with their pollinators. So almost all of these species rely on pollinate, insect pollinators for, for reproduction. If some of them move quite early, and some of them move quite late, there might be gaps in the nutrients for the pollinators. No food, kind of in the middle of the season. That would be bad for the pollinators, but it would affect the plants too, because then the pollinators would die out and the plants wouldn't get the reproductive services from the pollinators. To be able to see changes as directly as changes in phenology is pretty, pretty remarkable and really frightening. The challenges of climate change are so sweeping, they are forcing park managers to re-examine basic principles and their dwindling options. If funding is, is, is an obstacle where you cannot either protect the riverbanks or you can't elevate the roads, uh, I think you need to have a, a real conversation on what that access is going to be. I think, you know, the park has over a billion dollars worth of infrastructure in the park right now. So, I mean, the American people have been making an investment in this place for generations, you know, since the park was established in the late 1800s. We've lost some access right now and some of what people did use and enjoy. Um, but again, I would hope that because of the tremendous investment that people have already made in this park that we would find a way to fix it and sustain it. But I think that becomes more challenging over time you know, with some of what we're, we're looking at. Worst case scenario, you know, what Congress creates, Congress can undo. So uh, we would certainly hope that uh, things would not radically change in Mount Rainier over time, but it's uh, uh, entirely possible that uh, things may look different in the future. Mm -hmm.